are some things just aren't what they used to be, medicine being one of them. Allow me to set the scene for you. Imagine you cut yourself by accident. Maybe you took a fall during a football game or had a slip with a kitchen knife while cooking dinner. You go to your medicine cabinet and pull out a fresh cream that will do just the trick in healing up this nasty wound. You open up the lid and take a whiff. <sighs> ah, there it is. That unforgettable aroma of opium, viper skin, and human excrement? Could any other smell quite so perfectly encapsulate the idea of health? I don't think so. And while this special mixture might not be sitting in your medicine cabinet, it might have been quite a different story were you born in the Middle Ages. This cream known as Theriac was a highly popular cure in the medieval times, and just one of the delightful cures we've sadly fallen out of the habit of using in our modern age. Today on History Unveiled, let's take a walk down memory lane and take a look at the world of medieval medicine. Number 1. Theriac As mentioned, some of the most common ingredients used to make the healing substance known as theriac were opium, viper flesh, and the excrement of other humans. The mixture was believed to have healing properties and was used to treat a wide range of ailments including snake bites, fever, and wounds. Modern naysayers would probably like to point out the use of theriac was not without its risks. In many cases, the mixture could become contaminated with harmful bacteria or parasites, leading to further infection or illness. And fine, I'll say it, the use of human excrement as an ingredient was not only disgusting, but could also spread disease and contribute to unsanitary conditions. There are reports of soldiers and knights being treated with theriac after being wounded in battle, often leading to further complications and sometimes even death. Returning home from a battle and rubbing poo onto himself isn't quite the image most people have of heroic medieval knights, but that was the reality of picking up battle wounds during the Middle Ages. Number 2. Trepanation Ah, trepanation, the medieval equivalent of popping an aspirin. It's the practice of drilling or cutting a hole in someone's skull to relieve the pressure on the brain or release evil spirits. Because, you know, that's a totally reasonable way to treat headaches and mental illness. Back in the day, trepanation was performed by barbers, blacksmiths, and other non-medical professionals who had a sharp object and a willing patient. And why not? Who needs medical knowledge when you can just hack into someone's skull and hope for the best? But despite the fact that trepanation was often carried out by untrained individuals, there were some cases where it was actually successful. Take the French king Henry II. In 1559, he was jousting when he was struck in the head by a lance. The lance shattered his helmet and a large piece of metal was lodged in his skull. The king's surgeons attempted to remove the metal but were unsuccessful. Eventually, they decided to perform a trepanation and were able to successfully move the metal from Henry's skull. Remarkably, the king survived the ordeal and went on to rule for several more years. Of course, most trepanations didn't have such a happy ending. They carried a high risk of infection, brain damage, and in many cases, death. Unfortunately, there are still people today who believe in the supposed benefits of trepanation. They argue that it can increase brain blood flow and relieve pressure on the brain, leading to a sense of euphoria and improved mental function. Needless to say, this is a dangerous and misguided belief and should not be attempted under any circumstances. So let's all agree to leave trepanation in the past where it belongs. Number 3. The Four Humors What's better than humor? How about four humors? Albeit, the medieval sense of the word had a rather different meaning than it does now. And that's because the medieval period was marked by a unique medical philosophy known as the Four Humors. Now, this concept was based on the idea that the human body was made up of four distinct bodily fluids, or humors. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. According to this theory, an imbalance of these humors was responsible for a wide range of illnesses and ailments. For example, if a person had too much blood in their system, they might be diagnosed with a fever or inflammation. On the other hand, if someone was carrying around too much black bile, they might be diagnosed with depression or melancholia. 
Medical practitioners at the time believed the key to treating these illnesses was to restore the balance of the humors through various interesting and often invasive means. For the uh, artsy folk among you, you might have heard of this concept before. The humor's theory was so ingrained in the popular imagination that it continued to be referenced in literature and art long after it had fallen out of favor in medical circles. Shakespeare's play The Taming of the Shrew, for example, features a character named Hortensio, who claims to be down with a case of excess yellow bile. Similarly, popular artwork of the time often depicted the four humors as personified figures, with each humor represented by a different character or symbol. Clearly very different from our current understanding of the human body, this approach was taken very seriously by medical practitioners of the time. One popular treatment to restore the balance of humors was purging, which involved inducing vomiting or diarrhea to expel the excess humors from the body. This was often done using laxatives or emetics, but could also involve ingesting substances like mercury or arsenic, which were highly toxic. Doesn't hearing all this just make you wish you could pop over to a medieval doctor next time you're feeling fluey? No? Just me? Number 4. Bloodletting One medieval medical practice that managed to be even more charming than its already delightful name was bloodletting. Well, actually, it's exactly what it sounds like. The procedure involved deliberately letting blood out of the body in an attempt to cure illnesses. This practice was based on the belief that many illnesses were caused by an excess of blood in the body, and that by removing some of this excess blood, the body would be better able to fight off the illness. How on earth did they come up with these theories? Anyway, one of the most famous incidents of medieval bloodletting is the tale of the Italian priest and philosopher Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas is often considered to be amongst the most influential thinkers of the entire medieval period, and yet his life may have come to an end due to the practice of bloodletting. As the story goes, Aquinas was suffering from a severe headache after hitting his head on a fallen branch, and his physician recommended bloodletting as the cure. Aquinas agreed to the procedure, but his physician was so eager to drain the blood that he accidentally nicked an artery, causing Aquinas to bleed profusely. Despite the best efforts of his doctors, it is said Aquinas died a few days later from the resulting infection. But as popular as this tale is, there are no surviving accounts to tell the exact details of Aquinas' death. So it's best to interpret this story as a testament to the riskiness of draining someone's blood than stone-cold historical fact. Either way, Aquinas didn't have to worry about that headache for too long. Number 5. Leeching Leeching was another common medical procedure in the Middle Ages, and thanks to its name, you can probably tell where this is going. Yes, applying leeches to a patient's skin to suck out their blood. Like bloodletting, it was based on the theory that diseases were caused by an imbalance of bodily fluids. While not as dangerous as bloodletting, leeching was not without risks. Leeches can transmit infections and diseases, and their use could lead to excessive bleeding, anemia, or even death. Imagine that from something as cute and lovable as a leech. Leeching was so popular during this era that physicians themselves were called leeches by many, and each year they were using millions of these wriggly little parasites to suck the blood out of their patients. So much so that leech collecting itself became a popular business. But the practice of using blood-sucking leeches to heal the sick was not restricted to the medieval times, mind you. It's been around for thousands of years, and in fact only got more popular after the Middle Ages, causing leeches to be declared extinct in some parts of the world. And although leeching eventually fell out of favor with doctors, the critters have made a surprising return in recent years. Albeit doctors no longer use wild leeches. It seems our medieval counterparts were onto something, as leeches secrete a natural anticoagulant that fights blood clots and restores proper blood flow to inflamed parts of the body. In fact, thousands of patients owe the successful reattachment of body parts to miraculous technological advances in plastic and reconstructive surgery, all thanks to leeches. So what about you? Checking your temperature yet? Or feeling eager for a trip to the medieval hospital? I thought so. 
If you're enjoying this dive into the oh-so-lovely world of medieval medicine so far, make sure to subscribe, hit like, and tap the notification bell while you're at it to make sure you stay up to date with all other marvels of the medieval ages. Number 6. Mummia when it comes to bizarre medical practices of the medieval period, few are quite as special as the use of mummia. But what exactly is mummia, you ask? Well, essentially, a great deal of medieval people thought that there were amazing healing properties to a substance made from the powdered remains of mummies. Yeah, you heard that right. Mummies, as in the preserved remains of ancient Egyptians? This practice was remarkably popular in Europe during the Middle Ages, where it was believed to have powerful healing properties. It was often used as a panacea or a cure-all for a wide range of ailments, from headaches and stomach aches to broken bones and even the dreaded plague. So how exactly did this practice come about? Well, the practice of using mummia as medicine originated from the renowned Persian mummia black pissisfold treatment for wounds and fractures, which was mistakenly identified with black bituminous materials, utilized in Egyptian mummification due to their similar appearance. This was misconstrued by medieval Latin translators to imply the use of complete mummies. And so the trade of mummia began. Merchants would travel east to purchase mummies, which they would then often bring back to Europe to sell to medical practitioners. The mummia would be grounded up into a fine powder and mixed with various substances such as honey or wine to make it more palatable. But was there any actual medical benefit to using mummia? Well, not really, no. Despite its popularity, there is no evidence to suggest that mummia had any actual healing properties. In fact, it was more likely to cause harm than good as the powder would often be contaminated by harmful bacteria or fungi. Even still, a far more exotic remedy than anything I've encountered in a modern apothecary. And on that note, I think it's best to bring this list to a close before I start checking where I can buy leeches and mummies online. You know, just in case. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any more of History Unveiled.